That, then, is the story of the Omega Minus. What does it mean? What is the significance of the fact that nature seems to obey this rule? I think today nobody knows. We'll only know, really, when we completely understand, or more completely understand, the fundamental laws of interaction of the nuclear particles. And this is a vital step forward to that understanding. But it isn't the understanding itself. And until we get that, we'll not really know the meaning of this, uh, the fact that nature seems to obey the rules, guessed at by Gelman and Neumann. It's analogous to the discovery of the periodic table by Mendeleev a century ago. He discovered at that time that various chemical elements came in families and that there were relations among them, that the chemistry of sodium and potassium, for example, were similar. This was extremely important in the development of science and in bringing about the ultimate understanding of, it, of the behavior of atoms. But the real understanding of the reason why sodium and potassium were similar, why the periodicities among the chemistry, in the chemistry of the various elements existed, could only come with the 50 years later with the knowledge of atomic physics. And this knowledge required a complete transformation of ideas about nature, a complete change of the philosophical position. Ideas that were impossible to appreciate at the time of Mendeleev. The principle of uncertainty of Heisenberg had to be discovered. The whole understanding of the, of the relation of cause and effect had to be modified with the principle of indeterminacy. And so it's going to be here. We will not understand really what, what nature, how nature find, makes this rule until we understand the nuclear interactions and we won't understand those. I'm sure without a deep and profound transformation of ideas somewhere along the line. We already see some of the difficulties. This law of Gelman and Neumann, this symmetry law, is not a perfect symmetry. If it were, the statement would be that the replacement of one particle by another will make no change. For example, the replacement of a neutron by a lambda should make no change. And yet the neutron and lambda differ in mass alone by some 20%. So there alone is a change that when you take a neutron and replace it by a lambda, the mass is different. So this symmetry is not perfect. It's an imperfect symmetry. Physicists are happy with a perfect symmetry. To say something is absolutely true and absolutely symmetrical seems to be a succinct, simple, and elegant statement of a law of nature. If a thing were completely unsymmetrical, then there would be nothing to say. But by what kind of a view is a thing that is only partly symmetrical natural? Is a thing that is only partly symmetrical beautiful? Well, the artists say that in this camellia bush here, the artists feel that the camellia, in its partial but near symmetry, is especially beautiful, and far more beautiful than a perfect geometrical pattern. But physicists feel that a partial symmetry is an indication that some deeper and more profound description of nature is possible, that there's gold in Benvar Hill. So we got a peculiar thought to grapple with, this partial symmetry. We're kind of stuck. Uh, we need a new idea. Before we'll really get the nuclear forces understood, some great new idea is required. Looking for symmetry is an old one. Poincaré suggested it. Einstein used it. Really came into its own when quantum mechanics was developed. But the, all the information that we're accumulating, the places where they we're really getting stuck, understanding the relation of these particles, is somewhere where we're missing some important great idea. We have some prejudice that's in our way. That's the way it always is in these pinnacle discoveries. The big pileup of stuff, all the old things that you've thought of before, you try again and again. But the great discovery always involves a great philosophical surprise. The pinnacle discovery isn't so much a fact as that it's possible to look at nature in a thoroughgoingly different idea. How strange it is, listen to this. How much is known after 200 years of studying physics? How much is known about the electrons, light, everything? And in order to understand the nuclear forces, it's almost certain 
that we're going to have to take a completely different view about everything that we know already, philosophically, that is. We're going to have to find another way to look at the world in which everything that we've already found out about it is the way it is. And yet, that little detail about what goes on in the nucleus then falls into place. It's a very hard job. It's lots of work. So what do we do it for? Because of the excitement, because of the fact that each time we get one of these things, we have a terrific El Dorado. We have a wonderful uh, new view of nature. We see the ingenuity, if I may put it that way, of nature herself, the peculiarity of the way she works. It takes a terrible strain on the mind to understand these things, and the real value of the development of the science in this connection, or I mean, the thing that makes me go on, is this, the, the, the difficulty of understanding it, that these apes stand around and look at uh, nature and find that to really catch on, they have to polish their mind to the very last. We live in a heroic age. We live in a moment that will never come again. These discoveries cannot be made twice. One doesn't discover America two or three times in succession, really. And one doesn't discover the laws of nuclear forces or electricity more than once. People say, some people say, our age is meaningless. Those are only people who don't know what we're doing in this age. That this age is the age in which mankind is finding out about the nature that he lives in. And if they don't understand what's already been uncovered, they can't appreciate the search. What makes us so sure that the new discovery of the uh, interrelationship between nuclear forces is going to be so wonderful? How do we know it isn't going to be some complicated, dirty, and or simple thing? We don't know, but we keep on trying anyway. We're not sure. It's worth the risk, because it very likely will be peculiar, and if it is, it'll be very interesting. How long is it going to take? Do we have all the clues? Every time there's been a very great discovery, one can look back and say, why didn't we think of that before? Of course, there's a time so far before that you say, well, the reason they didn't think of it, they didn't have enough facts from experiment. Question. Do we have enough facts from experiment so that after this thing is discovered, people look back and say, why didn't they think of that before? How far before? In 1964. My colleagues don't agree with me, but I think this is the day. I think that we now know enough that if with a sufficiently clear reasoning we could come to the answer, or put it another way, when we do finally find the answer, after the experiments have given us too many clues, a lot of extra clues, we'll look back and we'll see how a perfectly sensible, logical line of reasoning from the present position could have brought us to the understanding. I wouldn't have said that before the discovery of the Omega Minus. That, to me, is a significant...